Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to wait a minute or so for some other people to jump on and then we will get going. Just have a quick drink before I get going as well. Right, okay, we will make a start being as we are bang on five. So thank you very much for coming. Um, if you are new or um, not and you're used to me, um, you're very welcome. So we'll be doing Unseen Poetry again today. I inadvertently chose a poem, I'm quite cross with myself, managed to choose a poem that is on the love and relationships um, bundle for AQA and I hadn't realised, but I will be tackling it as an unseen poem essentially. Um, and I thought that generally love and relationships isn't the popular bundle for um, schools to do and a lot of schools are dropping poetry for this year's um, ex exams anyway that's the module that they are dropping so I didn't think it was too bad a mistake and I actually really love this poem so that is what we are doing today if you haven't met me before my name is Vicky um, my undergrad was in English language and linguistics at the University of York I also trained as a teacher at York Uni as well um, and I'm coming up to 800 lessons beginning of next week um, on my tutor so I'm very excited to hit that milestone um, and I've been tutoring since September 2019 so that's a little bit about me if you don't know already so I'm going to whiz over what the format of an unseen poem looks like um, in the exam and to understand how we apply all of these poetic devices. Poetry has a load of devices which we purely talk about just for poetry and we can't use it anywhere else. So there's, I think poems are a little more tricksy in terms of terminology because there's more to get your head around um, and poems can really, really range. Um, so I showed this slide last week, but to just give you a quick reminder as to what it will look like on the exam, you will be given a poem that you have never seen before. It will be relatively short. You won't be given anything as wordy as the prelude, for example, by Wordsworth or My Last Duchess. Both of them are really, really long. Um, you'll probably be given something that will fit on a page of A4, but it, the stanzas will be relatively short. They won't be really, really lengthy um, because otherwise you've got loads of information to process in a really short space of time. So generally, they don't give you... Um, I haven't come across any of the past examples where I thought, oh my goodness, that is a really tricky poem to deal with. So these are a couple of um, examples you will always get in whatever poem, how does the poet present? That always stays the same. And then for, we've got speaker's attitudes there and the effects of season of autumn, there's a variety of things going on. Um, so that changes from poem to poem, obviously, because not every poem, um, the season was all autumn aren't relevant so what i would like you to do for me please in the chat and the q a function whichever suits you i would like you to name as many as many poetic features as you possibly can for me please see how many you can remember i'll keep an eye on the chat whilst you were doing that Just double checking, I haven't put the question up on here, but it's fine. I know what the question is for the text. Allegory, refrain, yep, lovely. Couple from last lesson. Assonance, yep. Rhyme, absolutely. Rhythm. Fab, yep. Yeah. Um, couplet, lovely. Fab, so all of those, which blank has been absolutely amazing, have written absolutely masses for me. Consonants, lovely. Um, so all of those, apart from allegory, are pretty much poetry exclusive. Uh, Sejora as well, they're poetry exclusive. Allegory, you could see over a course of any type of literature. So allegory Christmas Carol the political message there is that um, those with more money should be helping those with 
um, that are in poverty. That's the message with that one. Fabulous. Right. Okie doke. So I'm going to go over the poem with you and I'm really annoyed that I've forgotten to put the question. Um, but we will read the poem first and worry about that later. So I've segmented it and unfortunately that little box has had a moment. Um, so I've segmented it. There's six stanzas, but they are all quite small short stanzas. Um, so I've segmented it onto each page. You've got three uh, stanzas. So I'll just read it, read over all six stanzas to start with, and then we will start working through these um, questions um, before we get cracking onto what on earth we do with all of this information. So my father worked with a horse plough, his shoulders globed like a full sail strung between the shafts and the furrow. The horses strained at his clicking tongue, an expert. He would set the wing and fit the bright steel pointed sock. The sod rolled over without breaking at the head rig with a single pluck of reins. The sweating team turned round and back into the land. His eye narrowed and angled at the ground, mapping the furrow exactly. I stumbled in his hobnailed wake, fell sometimes on the polished sod. Sometimes he rode me on his back, dipping and rising to his plod. I wanted to grow up and plough, <clears throat> to close one eye, stiffen my arm. All I ever did was follow in his broad shadow round the farm. I was a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping, always. But today it is my father who keeps stumbling behind me and will not go away. So thoughts, ideas, opinions then on that poem. Anything that sticks out. There's a few bits of vocabulary that I'm expecting we might not be um, completely sure about. Um, and I've forgotten again to um, pop them at the bottom um, like you would get in an exam which are sort of related to um, sort of farming if you like sort of old-fashioned farming as well um, so I think sod is one of them so um, this is referring to um, an old-fashioned plough which is pulled by horses So something that is pulled like this and then what you see that's being turned over creates little lines. So here, this picture, these little lines are the sod. So that's what that one is. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Furrow is a name for the plough, the little bit of machinery that that man is holding and keeping um, in a straight line, that's the furrow. Um, what else did I think? Do, 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 do. I think that's about it. Hobnailed as well. Let me just double check that one because I looked it up and I've forgotten. So that is a short, heavy headed nail used to enforce boots, almost like steel caps, similar sort of thing. Right. OK, so Blank has put something lovely in the chat for me. So let's have a look. So it speaks about the circle of life, how he was once in the shadow of his father. And now it's the other way around. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so being as you've brought that up immediately, let's talk a little bit about that in more detail. So. We've got a really nice example of it. Oh, don't tell me my pen's not working. I'm not having a good day today. There we go. Right, so you've come across something really nice there. And in terms of the circle of life, we obviously know what a circle is. So we start at this little green dot here, for example. Um, we've got the uh, narrator 
being a nuisance because he's a child. And then we go all the way around him describing how much of a pain he is. And then we then have the narrator's dad instead. But he is a nuisance and a pain here because he is an old man and needs care and attention, um, which links really, really nicely to um, Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man, if you've ever come across that. Um, the idea with that is that you start off as a baby being completely helpless and you have to have everybody do everything for you. And then as you go through the different stages of life, you then return back to that state where you can't do anything for yourself and you need to be looked after um, and sort of almost like respite care, if you like, towards the end of somebody's life. So it's the idea that we all go around in that same circle and it keeps repeating and repeating. So that's quite a nice thing to sort of see in terms of correlation. Right, let me zoom this out a little bit so we can see more of what's going on. Right, so just about squeeze all of that in. Fabulous. Right. So what can we say about the use of sounds? Sounds are really, really important in this poem. So based on these three stanzas that we've got here, what sorts of things could we be looking for? So under the sound bracket, we've got alliteration, we've got sibilance, we've got onomatopoeia, um, we've got consonants, we've got assonance. Those are the majority of them. I might have missed the odd one out here and there. We could also talk about rhyming as well. So, oh, my pen stopped working again. I think we're just going to have to type today. Unless it's a battery problem. a battery and then if it doesn't work I will just type for the rest of the lesson. Right. Let's see if that brings us any luck. Nope. Right. Okie dokie. So we'll get rid of that idea for this lesson. So, the sounds being used then. So, let me just double check no one's popped anything in chat. No, so I will get cracking. Um, please, if you want to contribute, that would be absolutely lovely. Um, but if you want to just sit and watch, that's fine as well. Um, but I am always up for your guys' thoughts and opinions. Um, it makes it much more interesting for me because I feel like I'm just talking at you for an hour. So if you want to share things, please feel free to in the Q&A or the chats. Um, I would very much appreciate them, but it's also fine if you don't want to. So in terms of sounds, we've got, we haven't got any rhyming in the first stanza. Um, and we've got some near rhyming in the second stanza. So we've got, um, sock and pluck which is the vowel is slightly different but the ending is the same so we've got a near rhyme because it's not quite entirely there um and then we've got um an actual rhyme which is uh, in the third stanza so we've got um round and ground so somewhere we would expect to see it's relatively non-committal so um we could say that the rhyming structure is irregular to start off with and then we could talk about why that might be later on when we get to thinking about doing analysis. Um, right, so we've also got this brilliant um, soundscape going on. So we've got some onomatopoeia. So we've got clicking Clicking of his tongue, which I really, really like. Um, bu 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 bu. We've got pluck as well. Um, have we got anything else on there? No. 
Now let's see if we've got any repetition of particular consonants, alliteration, um, anything along those lines. So we've got some sibilants. So we've got uh, shoulders, globed like a full sail strung. So we've got shoulders, sail and strung there. Um, and then we've got quite a lot of S's going on in that first paragraph, a lot of sus signs going on. Um, so my father worked with a horse plow, his shoulders globed like a full sail between the shafts and the furrow, the horses strained at his clicking tongue. So I would say there's probably more use of the O uh, or a. Uh, um, Ver, not verb signs, um, vowel signs, then we might normally see, but I don't think there's enough there for us to actually go off and write something about it. So I'm not going to note that down to start off with. So an expert, he would set the wing and fit the bright steel pointed sock. So there, I think we've got a little bit of consonants going on, not consonants, assonance. Where's my brain today? Um, so we've got the repetition of the I sound. So we've got um, wing, we've got fit, we've got bright. Um, steel is really rather close. So the I and the um, E signs are really, really close together. Um, so if I just show you, actually, let's have a look at this. So, um, bu -bu -bu. so this is something that you deal with if you go up to university level, um, which is what we call phonetics and phonology. And all of these symbols represent particular signs. So every sound that we know of that exists in a language somewhere um, is on this chart. We don't have all of them in English. So we have right at the top here is E. Um, so stretching your mouth as wide as you can for that one. And the pronunciation is right at the front because your tongue is touching the back of your, back of your teeth or your hard ridge, your hard palate. And then we've got close mid, which is e here, and i, i is here, somewhere in between the two. We have a as in bag and um, r as in bar. Um, and we use these ones as well up here. And we use a schwa as well, which is the most common one. That's a very good question. If you do linguistics at uni, do you do about the linguistics of English or just more than English? More than English. So I only did, um, this is phonetics and phonology. I only did it in my first year. Um, it wasn't my module at all. Um, I rather enjoyed it, but it's very, very technical. Um, so one of my assessments was on how an English speaker and how a Polish speaker would pronounce the word Gdansk um, and how that was different. And he looks a lot of, you look at lots of different um, signs because not all of these are covered in one single language. So for example, um, with this Y here, that would be like you would have in French, but we don't have that. And it's the same with, so this is the full table and it's the same with all of these sounds as well. So we've got pub, ba, ta, da, Ta, da, I'm not sure what those ones sound like. I can't quite remember. K and G, and we have the uh as well. We use the m, n, and, and this one. So, for example, swimming the n at the end. Um, you've got other things like trills, which we don't have in this language. So, <laughs> I can't do it very well. <laughs> like, <laughs> nah, only I can't trill my lips at all. And, <laughs> Um, so you have to go off and look at other languages that use them. Otherwise, you would never look at the entire table. And that's the whole idea. 
Another question, would it be more focused on English or other European languages as a whole? I think it depends on what uni you go to and what lecturer you have. Um, mine did a lot of work with some, oh, was it, I can't think what language it was. It was quite a specific Middle Eastern language and she did a lot of work from media there and um, maybe it was Arabic. I can't remember now, but it depends on the specialism that your um, that your tutor has. Is linguistic anything to do with grammar? It depends on what modules you do. Um, so the first year of uni, if you do language and linguistics is usually, or at least it was for me, phonology um, and phonetics, syntax, semantics, sociolinguistics. Those were all the linguistic modules and I did English language as well. So I did English grammar and the history of English. So it depends on which module you take. If you take a particular module that focuses on um, the syntax of a particular language, you will look at grammar. It depends, really. Yes, there is some grammar involved, but you can choose to a certain extent how much you look at it. Um, I went more down the grammar route because I'm a bit of a nerd. Right, so very long tangent there, but I think we got some good things out of that in terms of Q&A and discussion. Um, but I will no longer be returning to the IPA chart. It, but there's some interactive IPA charts if you're interested, if you just type in interactive IPA chart and you can click on them and they make the signs for you if you're interested. Um, right, okay. So we've also got a bit of um, assonance going on at the bottom as well. Um, so we've got narrowed, angled, at, and. which is really, really nice and very, very neat. And you can just pull that straight out and you've got four words with the same vowels, which is really nice and tidy. Um, what can we infer about the father? So what do you guys think about the father based on those three stanzas? Initially, my ideas and thoughts would be that he is a hardworking man. He obviously does manual labor as well. So that could tell us that he is, um, he, his body um, is probably um, worn in some way. Um, so I think sort of any manual job might, or pretty much all the men in my family are mechanics um, and have been mechanics for 30 years. And they have um, sort of an odd chunk of finger missing. I've got one that doesn't have, my grandfather doesn't have a part of his nail um and scars where they've got themselves trapped in things or um sort of the oil that they've had on their hands sort of for a long time despite washing them um sort of leave still leaves a little bit of a tinge um so with this you could expect he's probably getting he's working in a field so he's probably going to get muddy farmers tend to have boiler suits on over the top of their clothes so they don't get absolutely filthy all the time and it's really easy to hurt yourself farming and get your fingers trapped in stuff and your hands are probably the one thing that is probably going to show the much so so show so much weathering um as you repeat that over a long period of time like this gentleman would um we can also see that there is um love and care for his child so even though he has got probably lots of work to do he is still there and working really really hard but being a father as well at the same time and balancing the two, which is really, really impressive um, and something that you do tend to see farmers do. Um, a lot of my sort of farmer friends when I was younger would take me out to do work with them um, in lambing seasons and um, hop picking um, because I was friends with their children and they just let me go along and I sort of just get to run around the farm and have a really brilliant time playing with lots of newborn lambs. Um, so as a child, 
being on a farm I personally found was really really fun and I absolutely loved every time I went to one of my friends houses who had a farm um so there's that to bear in mind what are the opinions or that the speaker holds so I thought he might be dismiss dismissive of the child because he lets his son trail behind him instead of asking him to help that's really nice so that's an alternative interpretation So that's really nice. Although with this, I do wonder how much help the child would actually be able to do. Um, because he wouldn't be able to hold the, the play because he wouldn't be strong enough. Um, so if you're not holding the play, there's not much else to do. Um, but that is a nice thought and that could well possibly be, um, be the case. So the opinions of the speaker. So he seems to very much idolise his father. Um, he seems to sort of be quite melancholy um, about his childhood. He seems to look back on it in fondness. But he also appreciates um, the difficulties of having a child and trying to entertain them while working. And I think that's something that I'm sure some of your parents, um, if you've got younger siblings, have probably been trying to do over lo the lockdowns that we've had, um, which can be really, really taxing. But it's not something that we think of as children, but as we get older, we think, oh my goodness, I was definitely thinking the other day, how did my mother put up with me? <laughs> um, I can't remember what it was about, but I sort of had this um, idea of, why, why, why did she put up with me? Um, so imagery. Imagery is really important pretty much for every poem. If there's nothing else that you're going to talk about, imagery is one to absolutely get down if all else fails. So in terms of imagery, we've got lots of, um, to me, almost like a landscape um, with a silhouette which I'm not going to spell properly. <laughs> um, and I also think of it from sort of a, from being a child size as well. As obviously, because he was quite young, he would have thought that his dad was probably a really big bloke. And then you've got horses, which are even bigger. So he probably feel really small and perhaps almost imitated, intimidated a little bit maybe. Um, and I think what else is really important is um, sort of the um, level of difficulty um, in the work and the types of verbs that he uses to um, demonstrate that. So for example, uh, sweating, um, set, rolled, there's a lot going on there. So other language devices, I'm looking at the time and I'm not going to note them all down, but I will go through and highlight some. So we've got simile at the top, globe like a for sale strung. Um, and then we've also got some sibilants there. Between the shafts and the furrow, the horse strained at his clicking tongue. So onomatopoeia there, an expert. Um, so we've got a sejour there we've got stop in the middle of the line he would set the wing and fit the bright steeled pointed sock the sod rolled over without breaking um at this hedgerig with a single pluck a little bit of um onomatopoeia there um sweating team turns a little bit of alliteration uh rounded back into the land we've got sejour there as well uh, his eyes narrowed and angled at the ground mapping the furrow exactly so I think going for mapping as a verb I think is a little sort of verging towards being a metaphor but not quite but I think an interesting verb to pick up on if you're looking for something sort of slightly more out there to talk about um, and then obviously throughout this we've got quite a lot of um, enjambment going on um, which we will talk about the purpose of that slightly later. Right, let's have a look at the other three stanzas. So, 
what can we say about the rhyming scheme? So I've already alluded to this a bit more, but the, it starts to become more regular. Um, so this would be really helpful if my pen was actually working, which I'm really cross about. So we would label uh, wake and back so they don't rhyme. And then we've got sod and plod. And then we've got uh, plow and follow. So that would be D, E, F, E. Um, and then we've got G, H, I, H. So it becomes more regular to start off with. It starts to get into the swing of it. So we've got our first stanza, no rhyming at all. We've got a near rhyme in the second stanza. Um, and then we've got lines one and three in the third stanza rhyming. Here, we've got stanza, we've got um, lines two and four in each stanza rhyming. So we now have a regular pattern, which is important. So genre is an enjambment. So we haven't got any, I'm just double checking. Oh no, we have, we've got one example down here of a sejura. Um, and then we've got a little bit of enjambment. Um, but that's almost pretty regular as well. So we've got lines, so C, F, and I. So the third the third line of each stanza. Um, we've got enjambment, so there's a pattern there. And we've also got it on second line of the final stanza as well. How does the speaker view himself and how does he compare to his father? Thoughts, ideas, opinions. Do you think he is, we know he idolises him, but how does he show that? And then how does he compare himself? So the first thing I'm going to go for is that he is writing um, about a child's perspective in an adult voice. Um, he's being very reflective and he's being able to appreciate um, hard work and childcare alongside them. Um, and initially he sees himself as a nuisance and then when his father reaches old age the father is the nuisance and I think that's meant in a loving way um, because that's just how life works isn't it um, so there's that to bear in mind. I think sort of try not to take that in a negative way because I don't think he is. I think he's really showing his admiration for him. He's just acknowledging the change in time and roles. So why is a strong sense of emotion important in this poem? So the big answers here for me would be um, to show unconditional love. to um, consider and provoke the reader to think about the changes of life. Um, and to also perhaps consider um, their actions um, when around their parents. Obviously this is written as, as a child, 
um, and what was going on there. But essentially, I think there's also that underlying thought of treating your parents well and nicely and not making their life purposefully more difficult. I think that's quite important as well. And I think it provokes you to think about and to empathise with your parents as to their role as a parent and what they are trying to do to help and support you throughout life. Um, and I think something that as you get older, you tend to think about in more detail. Right. In terms of language devices, I will just go through and do a quick highlight as well. Um, so... I would go for broad shadow for a hyperbole because I think it's probably at least in a child's perspective it's much bigger than it actually is. Um, and I think I would also go for, there aren't masses on here, the idea that the sod is polished it obviously won't be so that would be metaphorical. Um, But there isn't too much in terms of language devices, really. It's more, it's much more to do with um, the sounds and the rhyming. Um, and generally, quite simplistic language is being used. Um, so we could discuss why that's the case as well. So, how are we doing for time? We'll do that in a minute. So when it comes to what you should be looking to do, this is the AQA mark scheme. So I apologise if you're not doing the AQA. Um, so I've tried to decode a little bit for you um, what on earth all of these things mean, um, because I think it's difficult sometimes for teachers to agree on what they mean uh, compared to what you guys are trying to um, think of. Is there a name to address the fact that the poem has weird punctuation? No. So you have enjambment and sejura, and you can talk about how often those occur and how random they are or irregular, and you could evaluate it that way. Right, so A01, critically exp critical ex exploratory <laughs> conceptualized response to task and text. So that means you need to think about the different types of interpretations and what the poet is trying to say to you. Judi judicious use of precise references to support interpretations. So this means choosing your quotations well. So choosing the right quotations to support the right points and, and choosing more than one quotation to support to support a single point to strengthen your analysis and to be able to draw those patterns together as a consequence. Um, identify language devices and structural features. So writer's methods means language devices, structural features, rhyming, pretty much any terminology comes under writer's methods. Um, exploration of the effects of writer's methods on the reader. So that's your analysis of the methods, why they're there and um, how they affect the reader, essentially. So it's really important to talk about and mention the reader. You can give a first person, this makes me feel, that's fine to do if you want to, or you could say this makes the reader feel. I go for this makes the reader feel just because to me it sounds a little bit more sophisticated um, and more general and I'm not the idea that I might have come up with is an idea that it doesn't actually make me feel in that particular way but it might for somebody else so I think that's sort of a nice get around if you like um, for that if you're not into your poetry and you're not seriously affected by the poem that you've just read that's totally fine if you're not um, I think it's something you grow into I really didn't enjoy poetry when I was at school um, and now it's my favourite thing to teach. I absolutely love it. So, shall we do, let's do this because I think this is more important. So last lesson I showed you the flatters table that I use, which stands for form and structure, language devices, attitudes of the poet slash speaker, themes, emotivity and mood, 
readers' feelings and sounds. So I'm not going to worry about filling in the sounds in the language device boxes because we have already done that. Um, and there won't be much point writing it out all again. I'm going to go for themes to start off with. So I think themes are a really important tool. If you struggle to organise your writing, then having um, that in is really, really important and that can help you. Um, so themes we could go for um, nature, childhood. Um, we could go for uh, countryside. We could go for love, parenting, um, farming. So a variety of things there. And then you could pick out a few things from few examples from other bits and places so you could go for like maybe a language device or maybe thinking about a particular attitude that the speaker presents um form and structure so this is an interesting one um i would go that this is probably close to a ballad um just because ballads tend to be sort of sing-songy sound like lyrics um, and have a relatively sort of nice rhythm to them. But I don't think it's entirely a ballad because some of it's a bit rough and ready and it doesn't have, it's not, um, it's not hugely controlled. But at the same time, we've got, so we could put, um, isn't lyrical throughout, um, but it is regular. So we can't say that it's free verse because we have six stanzas that are four lines long. Um, so it is consistent. So we can't say that it's a free verse and it's not something very, very strict um, like a sonnet because those are really quite obvious to identify. So that's something to bear in mind as well. So in terms of we've got a regular structure in terms of stanza uh, lengths but we've got a range in um, line lengths so we've got some lines which are two or three words and then others which are six seven eight words so we've got a range there so that's this is a little bit more irregular so he's playing about a bit with the different things that he could potentially do um, you could also talk about sejouras here and enjambment both of those fit in quite nicely in terms of there's a bit of irregularity with them, but there's also some structure to them as well. So you can debate sort of where on that continuum of very, very structured and very, very tight to do whatever you like. And there isn't really a pattern. And I'd go for probably about there in that it is over the halfway line to there's more of a pattern than there isn't. Um, right. We've talked about readers' feelings a little bit in terms of how it makes us feel and consider. So particularly sort of reflective on our childhoods and our relationship with our parents um, and potentially reconsidering those relationships and how we can improve them. So let's pop that down because I don't think we wrote that down earlier. So um, an idea you might not think that and that's absolutely fine it's I'm going to be tentative about it when I start to write in a minute um emotive emotivity and move we've said is quite sad somber um but they're also being um sort of this continual love and respect throughout which is really important um, and I will leave the rest because we've already discussed them. So I will show you a little model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type the first one out as I go. We'll see how we do in terms of time and I'll talk you through what decisions I've made and why as I type. Um, and then we'll see how we are and I can either read you the rest. And I've tried to label the assessment objectives as well for you to see how they work 
in more detail. So our question is, how does the uh, poet present the speaker's attitude towards his father, which I stupidly haven't written down? So how does the poet present uh, the speaker's um, ideas? Let's go for thoughts, actually. Thoughts and opinions. of his father. So that's our question. So I'm gonna jump straight in with going with the speaker. So I'm making sure that I'm using the vocabulary from the question. Shows throughout the poem, his admiration for his father by, whoops, acknowledging by acknowledging his job. So that's my point. I'm then gonna put my evidence in and as you can see, I have integrated it, I've embedded it. So instead of saying this is shown by the quotation and then writing it, I'm just popping it straight in and I'm working it into a sentence. Um, examples really like you to do that because it's a little bit more tricky to do. Um, so I'm then going for the imagery um, because as we realised, there wasn't masses and masses of language devices to go at here. Um, so talking about imagery is really important and you can do that for any poem. Uh, the imagery used here demonstrates the clear physical exertion caused by his work. So initial quite basic analysis is it going to get you masses of marks as it's as it is as it stands no so we need to take it further and talk about interpretations add in some extra bits and pieces um, to take it further so due to this the speaker observes uh in a simile so now i'm managing to find a language device that i can actually touch and get down which links to my point so his shoulders Globed like a full sail. Then I'm going to talk about our interpretations, our analysis, and how the reader feels, um, which is what you're asked to do in the mark scheme. So this leads us to believe um, that the speakers father was muscular due to his work it implies that's the reason again quite basic to start off with this could potentially uh, be a hyperbole um, as the speaker as the speaker is basing this description from the view on the view he held as a child so now i'm moving on to talk about perspective and i'm acknowledging that i know that this speaker is now no longer a child and is a fully grown man and that i've understood the text and I'm starting to try to put myself into his shoes as a child and why he might reflect in the way that he does, which is where our big marks start to come in. Um, held as a child. And then what do we know as a result of this? Consequently, he would um, be significantly smaller in height compared to his father hence giving him this perspective so i've actually mentioned perspective at the end and i've made that blatantly obvious for the examiner that i know what i'm talking about here and i really understand structure and point of view as well as language devices i'm pulling them both together excuse me right so with this, we've got a few viewpoints. We've got the viewpoint of the father as a as a young parent, we would assume. We've got the viewpoint of the uh, 
the uh, man as a child, we've got the man when he's older, and we've got the view of the father when he's elderly. So how can we use that in our writing to show that we are able to appreciate the speaker's difference of opinions from all of those different perspectives. So the speaker's views of himself in the poem are fairly derogatory, meaning they're quite negative. He doesn't value himself. Um, I was a nuisance. Nice straightforward point and evidence. Now I'm gonna move on to my basic analysis. So this implies, so I'm now picking out something which is, isn't is um, directly told to us um, that the speaker is unable to appreciate um, that he was behaving as we would um, expect, um, where are we? expect a child to and instead uh, views himself as a clear, now I'm about to get really clever, <laughs> juxtaposition uh, to his father. So I'm now going to provide some evidence for that as well. So he sees himself as completely unskilled and just getting in the way and being an absolute pain. And he sees his father as someone really intelligent and an expert. And those are complete opposites of each other, which makes it a juxtaposition. And they are those are ideas and concepts rather than particular words. Um, so that's what makes it a juxtaposition instead of an example of oxymoron. Um, so I'm now going to tie in um, some structural um, devices to go along with this. So the use of this in line five, so I'm referencing where it is as well causes the reader to pause um, and actively acknowledge the craftsmanship of the father showing the idolization that his son has for him. So there you've got two paragraphs, which when it comes to writing and doing well in your um, in your schoolwork and getting those higher grades, a lot of schools teach variations on P paragraphs, um, which is a brilliant start. But I'd like you to remember that use that structure to help you um, rather than to um, hinder you. So you can see that I've done, so I've got my point there in the red. I've got my evidence in the green. Um, then I've got some basic analysis. Um, and then I've got another, I'm just gonna highlight that all as evidence because I'm leading into it. I've got some more evidence. This leads us to speak of farm, farm who is muscular due to his work. Again, relatively basic here. And then I'm tying all of this together and making it quite a deep analysis at the end. So am I using point evidence explain in a way? So I'm doing here, I've done point evidence, basic explanation, evidence, basic explanation, deep explanation. So I'm alternating between the two, which makes my um, answer more sophisticated rather than just doing a straight P paragraph um, and ending it here. I'm putting it into something which is much more sophisticated. Right, so I will show you quickly. Now's your time to get in questions. Um, so any other questions at the moment? Um, pop them in the chat, the Q&A as we finish off. Um, so I'll just show you this paragraph here so you can see where the AO1 is. So in the poem, it appears that the speaker believes his father and his work could not be faulted. His eye mapping the furrow, exactly this metaphor 
clearly shows the level of skill the father held as well as physical strength. Throughout the recollection, the speaker appears to only see the good in his father, follow in his broad shadow. The mention of the shadow could be symbolic as it tells the reader that the speaker feels unable to ever be equal of equal standing with his father. This could be due to viewing the experience through rose tinted glasses. The final stanza sees the juxtaposition of the two men switch as the narrator becomes a strong man who is followed by his father. We can assume that the father who keeps stumbling behind me is doing so due to old age. By revealing this at the end of the poem, the poet is able to effectively demonstrate the change of roles that parents and their children have as age limits the parents' capabilities. By choosing to leave this information to the end, the poet is able to create finality which can symbolise death. Potentially. Right, I've got a quick hoop for you. It's only five questions to finish off. Um, if there's anything you want clearing up, now's your time to pop it in the chat on the Q&A before we finish up for the day. I'll just unplug that so you can hear the music. So I'll pop the pin in the Q&A. I won't, I'll pop it in the chat. So we've got one in, as long as there's two of you, I'll start it when there's a couple of you on. Right, I'm going to get cracking just so we've got time to get to the end of it. So you can hop on as we go along. Two rhyming, rhyming lines are known as what? Rule of three rhyming couplet, stanza or triplet. Fab, brilliant. A poem that has little structure is known as what? A sonnet, a ballad, stanza right or free verse? Ooh, beautiful. Yeah, a ballad has some structure to it. It has a nice flowing rhythm all the way through. A poem consisting of 14 lines with a strict structure could be known as what? Ballad, sonnet, free verse or blank. Fabulous, nice and straightforward, that one, brilliant. As is doing really well, what is assonance? We've been doing this today. Repetition of consonant sounds, repetition of same vowel sounds, special type of alliteration, or repetition of harsh sounds. Fabulous, repetition of harsh sounds is dissonance. Lovely, and what is a refrain? When a line runs on into the next without punctuation being used, a list which is fast flowing, usually using commas, an incomplete stanza or a line, couplet or stanza that repeats itself throughout the poem. Oh, I've got you. So a line that runs on into the next without punctuation. That one is um, on John Munt. A list which is fast flowing is a syndactic list um, and a refrain is a, like, a little bit like a chorus, if you like. Think of it as a chorus in a song. So something that comes back time and time again throughout a poem. Fabulous. Right. So well done and thank you for participating in that. So I think that is everything from me today. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, there aren't any questions in the chat, so I'm going to assume that there aren't any. So I'm going to sign off. Thank you very much. I'm coming back on Tuesday and we will be back on structural uh, features, paper one, question three. And we'll be working with another text again like we did this week. Have a lovely weekend. Bye all.